Welcome everyone to the latest installment of EMS Focus, a collaborative federal webinar series. My name is David Bryson, and I am an EMS specialist with the Office of EMS at NHTSA. Together with our federal partners, NHTSA's Office of EMS is focused on advancing a national vision for EMS. The projects we undertake and the resulting resources for the community help to plan for system improvements, measure the health of EMS systems nationwide, and deliver the data that EMS leaders need to advance their individual systems. Another role of the Office of EMS is to educate the EMS community on new innovations, processes, and technologies that can help provide better and more efficient patient care. This free webinar series is a unique opportunity for federal EMS agencies to share information with the EMS community in a manner that is more personal and less time consuming than attending conferences, yet offers the community the opportunity to interact and ask questions that a newsletter or article doesn't allow. EMS Focus conducts webinars several times throughout the year on issues that are important to the EMS community and provides you with timely information on what federal agencies are doing about them. More information on the EMS Focus webinar series can also be found on EMS.gov, and today's webinar is being recorded and will be archived on EMS.gov for future viewing. In recent years, EMS has made great strides towards incorporating more evidence-based guidelines into patient care. As you'll learn today, there are other ways we can and should be using data, research, and evidence to make decisions that impact the safety of EMS personnel, our patients, and the general public. Every time you enter information in a patient care report or other data system, you are creating a vast repository of evidence evidence that can help all of us provide the safest, most effective, and most efficient care possible. Today, we'll discuss two critical topics in EMS and what we've learned by thoroughly examining the available data. First, we'll talk about lights and sirens. For much of the history of EMS, it was assumed that faster was better, but now we have research that can help answer the question of whether the benefits of lights and sirens use outweigh the risk. We'll hear what the evidence tells us and what it means for our own EMS systems. Second, we'll discuss fatigue. It's an issue that impacts all of us. I'm sure some of you now are on your third cup of coffee after a busy shift last night or a very early start to this morning. We'll learn about the most extensive investigation ever of fatigue's impact on EMS and how we can help mitigate those effects. We have a great panel of speakers today to share their work on these two important topics. Dr. Douglas Kupas serves as a professor of emergency medicine at Geisinger Health and as the EMS medical director for the Bureau of EMS at the Pennsylvania Department of Health. He completed his emergency medicine residency program at Geisinger Medical Center in Danville, Pennsylvania, has been a paramedic for more than 35 years, and is an active member of many local, state, and national organizations. He is passionate about EMS provider and patient safety and is the author of the report, Lights and Sirens Use by EMS, which he will present shortly. Dr. Daniel Patterson is an assistant professor of emergency medicine at the University of Pittsburgh, where he studies safety in emergency care settings with special emphasis on safety culture, fatigue, shift work, and sleep health in the pre-hospital EMS setting. He has led multidisciplinary teams and evidence reviews and experimental studies to improve safety. His research is informed by immersion in the EMS setting as a paramedic, and he serves as a principal investigator of the fatigue and EMS study. I'd now like to hand it over to our first presenter, Dr. Doug Kupas. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, next slide. So as you stated, I have been in, in EMS for a while, but my passion in research and speaking has been related to EMS patient and provider safety. And I think that uh, one of the things that has really swung by the way of pendulum swinging over the, those years is, is the talking about lights and sirens. 
when I first started speaking about lights and sirens at conferences uh, 25 to 30 years ago, it really uh, created more ire than uh, than you would imagine. And it was very difficult to remove the tradition and the excitement and all of the things behind uh, lights and sirens from science and, and what makes sense. Don't get the wrong feeling. I am not about throwing lights and sirens out. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm not saying we should never, ever use them. I think we should just take a very uh, scientific approach and look at lights and siren use as any other treatment that we would give to our patients. And that's the the take that uh, was done with this NHTSA paper. I'm not speaking today as a, uh, I should point out, not speaking today as an official from uh, Pennsylvania Department of Health. That is one of the roles that I hold. But this paper was written uh, at the request of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration because NEMSAC was interested in looking further into the evidence related to lights and siren. Next slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the potential for lights and sirens causing accidents or being related to accidents. There's a lot of literature that is in the uh, monograph related to that, but uh, we're going to take it as a given that there are situations where accidents occur that would not have occurred had a vehicle not been using lights and sirens and going through an intersection against a red light uh, or you know, those sorts of examples. So if we take it as a given that there are some lights and siren related emergency vehicle crashes that can be avoided, we want to, to look at then to the literature. Next slide. This was not what I would call a pure evidence-based review. It was meant to be a review of all of the literature that is available. So unlike traditional evidence-based reviews where you, you look for the highest quality evidence, our goal was to bring together all of the evidence and everything that has been written about lights and siren use uh, as far back as we can find. And it includes a lot of peer-reviewed research that is very well done, but it also includes non-peer-reviewed articles that occur in trade journals and, and that sort of thing. And all of that information was put together. Next slide. Probably one of the uh, strongest parts of this paper, and I would refer anybody that has additional questions to the paper because it's impossible for us to go through all aspects of, of lights and siren use in a very short phone call today. But I would refer you to the paper for some of the articles that are there. There is an annotated bibliography that breaks the articles down by, uh, by particular categories. So for example, there are 55 articles related to EMS vehicle crash statistics and driver training and ethics. Uh, the effectiveness of the use of a lights and or siren and vehicle conspicuity and color. There are 33 articles for that. Uh, there are articles related to the time savings with lights and siren response and transport. Probably more than most of you realize, uh, many people um, think back about the uh, famous paper by Hunt that sort of started all of this, um, but don't realize that there are 24 papers uh, that have looked at time saving with lights and siren response and or transport traffic pre, uh, signal preemption, there's a little bit of information related to that. There's some information related to the public expectations and perceptions related to lights and siren use. Next slide. And then the bibliography continues with information about provider safety issues uh, with lights and sirens, emergency medical dispatch and lights and siren use, uh, clinical outcomes with lights and sirens, which is the area that is of the most uh, interest to me. What do the lights and sirens do to the physiology of the patients that you're taking care of? What does the siren do to the physiology of the driver of the vehicle and the uh, crew members? And and then what are the clinical outcomes that we can tie to whether a patient is helped by lights and sirens or you know, maybe um, in some cases harmed by them? And then there's a section on EMS operations, policies, guidelines, et cetera. There's a total of 209 references uh, in those nine sections. And I would encourage anybody that has uh, additional interest to actually pull the monograph and look at these specific things we're speaking about. Next slide. So when we talk about the use of, of lights and sirens. Again, there are traditionally many reasons why uh, 
agencies and uh, providers have used lights or sirens. Saving time was uh, one of the standards uh, early on. There are a lot of particularly larger cities that contract for their EMS that are held to contracts that require the response times of less than eight minutes or less than uh, nine minutes or eight minutes, 59 seconds, uh, seven minutes, 59 seconds, written into uh, a number of contracts. And that can can be problematic in causing us to uh, to race to scenes when it's not benefiting the patient, it's only related to a contract. So we'll talk a little bit about, and the paper talks a little bit about whether cities should relook at that. Uh, medical emergency is often brought up as, as an issue, and that's, again, one of the most uh, interesting parts for me is what is the medical outcome of using the lights and sirens? We'll talk about that. And public expectations. A lot of agencies feel that the public is expecting them to use lights and sirens, and they will complain when they don't. I will show you that there's actually some evidence to the, to the contrary. Uh, EMS agencies may be missing calls, may have people in their community having, for example, a, a STEMI uh, or some other urgent medical situation where they don't call EMS because they are concerned about the sirens, the lights, the noise, the attention. And so in some cases, if we're using lights and sirens all the time, we may be driving some very legitimate patients to drive themselves to the hospital because they're uh, concerned about the response that they'll get. We can't pass up the the idea that uh, you know it. Uh, there's a certain degree of uh, excitement in driving lights and sirens, and some suggest that you know their providers will quit if they're not uh, permitted to uh, use the lights and sirens amply. I think the data probably shows the opposite. And frankly, if you have people that quit because they don't get the fun of uh, driving lights and sirens, they're probably not the compassionate. Uh, healthcare providers that you want taking care of your patients. Um, and some have in the past suggested that insurance companies actually require that, which really is not the case. Next slide. So we've taken uh, a look at this in a balanced approach, uh, what in medicine we would call primum non nocere, first do no harm. Any intervention that we get or give in medicine, whether it's a radiologic test like a CAT scan or whether it's a, a procedure that's done on a patient or a medication that's given to a patient, we want to be sure that we are not uh, causing harm with that uh, with that um, procedure. And, we, and in some cases, there is harm with the procedure, but we want to make sure the harm does not outweigh the benefit of the procedure. So lights and sirens, when they are used, should be really dispensed as a medical therapy and used only when they're going to benefit the patient. Next slide. I looked at the, uh, with the help of the um, NEMSIS um, Technical Assistance Center, looked at the current use of lights and siren in the United States. And there's a lot of information in these slides that uh, I won't speak directly about. Uh, they're there for reference as, as people pull the slide deck later. But bottom line is that in 2015, out of 15 million 911 responses with transport to the hospital, Across the country, 76.5% of those used lights and siren, and there was really almost no change from 2010 to 2015 in the statistics. On the transport side, 22.7% of all of the 911 responses that led to transport had lights and sirens used. So, you know, it appears that in general we are responding as a whole across the nation to about three quarters of the 911 calls with lights and siren, but we're transporting only about a quarter of the patients with lights and siren. The transport use of lights and siren does seem to be decreasing, but there's high variability in all of these things. Next slide. When you graph out some of this use, it's not that every agency across the country responds to three quarters of their calls with lights and sirens. As you can see from this graph, there are a large number of the agencies. As a matter of fact, the bulk of uh, any of the given um, decile spaces, uh, 292 agencies reported using lights and sirens in response uh, to 90 to 100% of their calls. While if you look, 17% of the agencies respond to to half of their calls without uh, lights and sirens. 
sorry, I'm sorry, let me let me rephrase that. 17% uh, of the agencies respond to less than 50% of their calls with lights and sirens. And I've circled a few agencies there. I'm the medical director of a relatively small agency in central Pennsylvania called Danville Ambulance. They respond to about 20 to 25% of their 911 calls with lights and sirens. Uh, in Oklahoma City, uh, and Tulsa, Oklahoma recently, they changed the governmental requirement of an eight minute response and they lengthened the response times for the highest priority calls, but also really lengthened the response time expectations for lower priority calls. And by doing that, they respond to about a third of their calls with lights and sirens. Um, and they're uh, essentially the one of the first major cities to to have um, have taken that approach and and done that. And they've cut their lights and siren responses by two thirds, but they haven't seen any any change in um, in patient outcomes from that. Next slide. If we look at a similar graph that looks at transport, you can see that 62% of the EMS uh, transports in the country. Uh, or agencies in the country transport less than half of their calls without lights and sirens. But the part that is of interest to me is the variation in this curve. We have a number of agencies that transport 0% or less than 10% or certainly less than 20% of their calls with lights and sirens. But the concerning part is that we also have 317 agencies that transport every one of their cases, lights and siren, no matter what. And 10% of the EMS agencies in the country transport 90% uh, or more of their cases with lights and sirens. So there's a definite dichotomy in, in thinking. And these aren't different types of patients. Um, they tend to be different, uh, different types of cultures. Next slide. So uh, the, the paper reviews some of the uniform vehicle code um, information related to how the vehicle code is related to this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in it, but I just wanted to point out that that's part of it. Next slide. And, and what I would like to uh, focus on is the discussion area of the paper, which also is broken down into various sections. And you can see that uh, in the discussion section, uh, there is uh, a significant amount of uh, information about various things, including some of the things we talked about earlier, like time saved with lights and siren, et cetera. Next slide. There's a little bit of information about uh, the usefulness of warning lights and other things to make your vehicle conspicuous. We still see uh, very darkly colored vehicles and you know poor selections in in, um, in vehicle design that would make them uh, a risk for uh, being seen that probably are, are much uh, bigger an issue than, than how many red lights are on the vehicle. Next slide. And also retroflective material uh, can be helpful in making your vehicle stand out uh, in, in some cases uh, even more important again than your light configuration. Next slide. This next slide shows a, an ambulance in, in downtown London uh, working its way through traffic with the, the lights on and siren on. But again, I would point out that the thing that uh, makes your vehicle conspicuous uh, often isn't uh, necessarily the, the lights at the first thing that people see. Next slide. The paper talks a little bit about the difference between requesting the right of way which is a time when you want lots of lights and there are lots of ways to do that, flashing headlights, flashing white lights on the top, you know, the primary response patterns that some of the light uh, companies have configured. Uh, your state may have different colors, et cetera. But in those situations where you're driving through traffic and you want people to see you and we're requesting the light right of way, uh, lots of uh, lights and different configurations that the paper talks about are helpful in getting people's attention. Next slide. One of the things that we spend a lot less time on is the uh, blocking the right of way um, concept, which is that when you're responding through traffic, you want them to see you from blocks away. You really want to be visible. 
when you are blocking the right of way, often drivers do not give a lot of thought to this and they pull in and stop at a scene and leave all of the same lights on that they had when they were responding. And this this uh, picture shows a, a great example of that because when the, the these two pictures were taken under the same exact conditions, same camera, same camera settings, same location. On the one with the, the lights flashing, you can see very little around the vehicle. You can't even see that the passenger door is open. On the other one where the lighting configuration is much less and an amber colored uh, directional signal is used in the back uh, instead of the flashing lights, uh, it is much easier to see anybody that is standing outside of the vehicle moving around the vehicle and and uh, that's a, a concept that uh, often we don't do enough in training with the b blocking the right of way versus requesting the right of way. Next slide. And this is the, essentially the same kind of views from the from the front of the vehicle, and you can see the the difference that those those make. Next slide. The discussion section also covers. Um, the usefulness of sirens and uh, I had this happen just yesterday when a, a state police was uh, I was in one of our supervisor vehicles and a state police was on the interstate uh, um, trying to pass traffic and get uh, get up the interstate to a, a situation and many of you have probably experienced this you know you do not at interstate speeds or in certain situations hear a siren even when a vehicle is right behind you and it might be on uh, completely so uh, the paper has a lot of information about the, uh, both recent and past studies related to siren uh, propagation. Next slide. The time saved slides are broken down or tables are broken down into time saves during response. And in this case, you can see that the many studies show that the time savings is uh, anything from, you know, one and a half minutes to three and a half minutes. Next slide. And then during transport, uh, including the, the hunt study there, you can see time savings range from uh, less than a minute, um, essentially about 43 seconds to about three minutes. Next slide. So it's a rather small amount of time that is saved that is only helpful in certain clinical situations. Uh, the paper also discusses other health hazards of lights and sirens use. There are a number of articles and studies related to uh, urban uh, EMS and fire uh, providers that have had uh, documented hearing loss due, uh, presumably associated with uh, lots of uh, siren noise and other on-the-job noise. There are also off-balance injuries in the back of a patient compartment if people aren't um, aren't buckled in as uh, as you're doing lights and siren driving. Next slide. And then the most uh, fascinating part of this, I think, is the. Uh, uh, is the clinical outcome. And I did in 1994 a study of 1,600 uh, plus uh, patients, um, 1,625 in a non-emergent transport group and 162 in an emergent transport group. And in, at that time, in 1992, 93, when this study was being done, only 8% of the patients were transported emergent. Um, those patients were uh, determined uh, or selected by a protocol. And the other 92 patients were deemed by the receiving emergency physician to not have any worsened uh, outcome related to the time sensitivity. Next slide. I want to point out one very interesting uh, slide, and then I'm going to wrap my part up here very shortly. Uh, in 1950 two or 53, there was a publication that just amazed me, and I only became aware of it during uh, this uh, paper. Next slide. These are the ambulances from 1952, 1953. And there was a group of emergency physicians in Florida that uh, began to question the number of patients that were being brought to their hospitals with the siren blaring. Uh, and essentially, those are the days when there was essentially no EMS providers, right? The, the providers had, with almost no training, put the patient on a litter, put them in the back of the ambulance, often rode in the front of the ambulance to the hospital, turned the siren on. And in their studies, they found that 87.8% uh, of the patients arriving by ambulance need not have been rushed to the hospital. Uh, and they basically found that 4.2% of all of those patients in that study were thought to be true emergencies that, in their words, conservatively, 
uh, may have benefited by lights and sirens. So it's interesting because we make a recommendation in the paper that uh, agencies should strive for a benchmark of transporting less than 5% of their patients with lights and sirens. And there are many agencies that have a 0% transport with lights and siren policy right now. Um, and the other thing that we make a recommendation to is that we should be trying to have agencies use a benchmark of responding to less than 50% of their calls with lights and sirens. Those are two suggested benchmarks uh, that would probably dramatically reduce lights and siren use and accidents due to them, but not change patient outcome. Next slide. And the last thing I'm going to make a um, notice of is, uh, uh, or talk to you about, is that there is some uh, interesting evidence related to patient perspe uh, perspectives and expectations. And in 1980, a study of um, EMS patients um, had this great quote from the author from the Connecticut EMS office, uh, E. Marie Wilson, who said, competence is more often shown by quiet deliberateness than by noisy bravado. Next slide. And in that study, uh, as well as several others uh, since then, they found that one of the public's reasons for uneasiness in calling EMS, and uh, in many cases not calling EMS when they should have, was due to sirens and noise and getting a lot of attention were the top two items on their uh, findings in back in 1980. Uh, next slide. So as I alluded to, um, there are a lot of recommendations that agencies can use as potential benchmarks, as potential things to consider if they want to try to drive uh, a, a safety culture and a more deliberate and thoughtful use of lights and sirens. And the 50% and 5% um, thresholds as potential benchmarks are two of them. There are a number of other uh, things that the paper has in recommendations. Next slide. And so I will leave you with uh, with those thoughts uh, related to lights and sirens, and primarily the thought that with the culture of safety, we should be treating lights and sirens as a medical treatment, and we should be deciding, is our patient going to be better because they got that treatment? Is it going to make them or their outcome better? Uh, and is there any potential harm uh, to using it excessively? So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kupas. Uh, as a quick reminder for our attendees, we will be answering questions at the end of both presentations. Uh, to send us your questions, please do so through the questions feature that you'll find there on your control panel uh, there as part of the webinar. Uh, I'd now like to hand it over to our second presenter, Dr. Daniel Patterson. Uh, thanks, Mr. Bryson. Uh, great presentation, Dr. Kupas, and thanks for the introduction. I um, hope everybody can hear me okay. I am going to talk to you today about a project, in particular phase one of a multi-year project that is really focused on fatigue as a problem in emergency medical services. Next slide, please. Now, we can, we can go to the news media outlets, such as um, some of the trade journals, some of the uh, local news media outlets, and identify some of the problems that we are potentially having with fatigue related incidences. Most of the ones that we read about involve a paramedic or EMT or other first responder uh, falling asleep while driving the ambulance, either on a transport, um, long transport, for example. But there are other incidences that are also fatigue related or sleep related. And those do pop up in the media every so often. And I collect these on a regular basis, and probably a month does not go by where I can I cannot find something that has been reported in either one of the trade journal websites or uh, some news outlet that has been circulated through a listserv, or for example. And a few, what you see on the slide here before you is just really a few of those that I've identified. So fatigue doesn't seem the issue of fatigue does not seem to be isolated to one part of the country. Uh, one uh, part of the, the, the uh, EMS operation. It is really uh, uh, widely distributed across EMS. Next slide, please. So NHTSA uh, recently, over, a little over a year ago, uh, funded a project with, uh, an, a, as a collaboration between the National Association of State EMS Officials and investigators uh, led by me 
uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, including investigators from, from multiple institutions, a really large team was put together to address multiple aims, multiple phases of a project focused on fatigue. And what I will talk with you today about is phase one, but I wanna give you sort of the high level view of the overall project. This project is multifaceted and is, it is broken up into three phases. Phase one is focused on developing evidence-based guidelines for fatigue risk management in the EMS setting. And once those guidelines have been developed, then we move on to phase two, where we want to actually test the implementation of one or more of those guidelines or one or more of those recommendations that are contained within the guideline. Uh, to see if they actually have an impact on outcomes of interest, such as acute fatigue uh, and safety outcomes, for example. Simultaneously with the execution of phase two will be phase three. Phase three involves the, the development of a biomathematical model that EMS agency uh, directors, administrators, leaders, managers can use free of charge to help inform their shift scheduling decisions. Now, one of the questions that you may have is what the heck is a biomathematical model? Well, biomathematical models are computer algorithms that take into account fluctuations in fatigue, uh, circadian sleep patterns, and shift scheduling information, and a few other variables, and put those into a mathematical calculation that can help predict, given the fluctuations in certain parameters, such as a shift schedule, if fatigue will be a risk, greater risk at certain uh, points in time, given the setup of a particular shift schedule. Now, these models, these biomathematical models are used every day in aviation and commercial aviation uh, and other high-risk industries, such as rail, maritime. Uh, if you happen to uh, have the privilege of riding on the metro in the DC area, the train operators follow or their schedule is informed by a biomathematical model. And that's just one example. But pretty much all of aviation uses at some degree uh, some input from biomathematical models. And we want to obviously uh, get in on the game here, so to say. We want to take advantage of this useful resource and actually tailor and uh, adapt one of the existing biomathematical models that, is, that, are out, that is out there to fit the EMS setting. And that's what phase three is all about. So again, phase two and phase three will occur simultaneously. Uh, phase one is really the focus of today's conversation. Next slide, please. So what are evidence-based guidelines? And what, what is involved in the process of developing evidence-based guidelines? Well, evidence-based guidelines are essentially uh, sets of recommendations that are informed by a review of the best available evidence. And the recommendations are formed by, by a diverse panel of experts uh, who weigh the evidence and come up with recommendations that, that can be uh, supported by the evidence. And so what we did was we uh, brought together a panel of experts that includes not only EMS, uh, people with EMS expertise and experience, an experience in emergency medicine and medical oversight, but also individuals who are world-renowned experts in fatigue science and sleep medicine. So we brought together this, this diverse panel per the recommendations of the Institute of Medicine, and we had the panel uh, help us form questions as a, as a first key step here, questions that will guide systematic reviews of the best available evidence that's out there. And the process that we went through to develop those questions has been published. So we have a, a descriptive paper and a summary paper of the process and steps we followed and completed with respect to formulating those questions that guided the systematic review that has been published. And the PMID number that you see there on the first bullet is a reference number assigned to that article. So if you're familiar with using the search database of PubMed Medline, just simply take that number and pump it, uh, uh, plop it into the search window and you should come to the article. If, however, you are unable to access the article, please don't hesitate to email me uh, directly and I will provide you with a copy of that article. My email is pdp3 at pit.edu, pdp3 at pit.edu. So what we did was uh, we used those questions to guide uh, systematic reviews, multiple systematic reviews, in fact, seven total. 
And we reviewed the literature as far back as 1980 because, and the reason we went back to 1980 is because the fatigue scientists who were on our panel said there's potentially some uh, important science that was published in the 1980s that we should take into account. And so we did that. And then once we collated all of that information, all of the evidence uh, linked to those seven systematic reviews, we then used a process for actually evaluating the quality of that evidence and presenting the quality of that evidence to the panel so that they could make the best decision they could make about a recommendation given the evidence. And that process is uh, officially known as the GRADE methodology or grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation methodology. Next slide, please. And the, what you see before you now on this slide is actually a visual illustration of that methodology. So we're going to start, I'm going to lead you through this slide real quickly. On the le upper left is uh, something called PICO. And that's actually an abbreviation for Population Intervention Comparison Outcome, which are components of research questions. And we had seven PICO questions. And we also had the panel select outcomes of interest, such as safety outcomes, cost outcomes, um, sleep outcomes, fatigue outcomes. And once we had the PICO questions and the outcomes uh, solidified, we then searched the literature, as I just described earlier, using assistance from medical research librarians and other uh, individuals to help us screen the literature. And then we summarized that literature into tables. And GRADE, the methodology of GRADE, actually has a set structure for how you do that. And as you populate those tables, you then simultaneously rate or evaluate the quality of that evidence. So what you have in the end is a table that succinctly summarizes not only how many studies addressed a particular outcome, but also what are the risk of biases and limitations associated with those studies. And in the end, on the far right of that table, uh, will be a quality indicator, which ranges from high quality evidence to very low quality evidence. And you can see on the far upper right side of the screen in front of you, those are the elements that we evaluate uh, when we look at, the, when we try to grade the quality of the evidence. So multiple element pieces of information that we try to uh, consider when we evaluate the overall quality of the evidence. The, going from the top right to the bottom right of that slide, you can see that we then take this su these summaries, these summary tables to the panel. And we say, panel, okay, now it's time for you to do your work. And number one, consider the quality of the evidence that we present to you given a particular intervention, such as use of caffeine or use of napping during duty, for example. Consider the overall quality of the evidence in making your recommendation, but don't just consider the quality of the evidence. We want you to also consider the balance of benefits and harms associated with a particular intervention. We also want you to consider the values and preferences of the target population, in this case, the EMS personnel and the leadership of the EMS personnel. We then also want you to consider the resource cost or the, the, the cost associated with adopting uh, a particular intervention. So when coming up with recommendations, I think it's very important for the audience to know that we don't just rely on the quality of the evidence in making a recommendation, or the panel does not just rely on the quality of the evidence. They also rely on other factors that can determine whether or not they issue a recommendation at all. They may not, they may not issue a recommendation given the, the potential weakness of the, of the evidence. If they do issue a recommendation, given those four factors, not, not just the quality of the evidence, but the other factors, they will then decide whether or not they issue a strong recommendation or a weak recommendation. Next slide, please. And so what I want to share with you now in the next few slides um, is basically a summary of the seven systematic reviews. And this is a high level summary. We do have a number of pa papers, scientific papers, that will be available free of charge for uh, a number of years. Uh, via the pre-hospital emergency care journal website. Those papers are expected to come out later this fall. Uh, but what I'm giving to you today is really a high-level summary of our results from those seven uh, systematic reviews and the recommendations that the panel came up with. So in total, we reviewed our team of more than two dozen uh, investigators across multiple institutions, reviewed more than 38,000 records of journal articles and related literature. Uh, 
probably the biggest review or largest review of its kind related to this topic. Next slide, please. Systematic review number seven. So I'm gonna go from seven down to one. The question that led this systematic review is in front of you. NEMS personnel, do task load interventions mitigate fatigue, fatigue-related risk, and or improve sleep? And the number that you see there next to the word Prospero is essentially the identification number assigned to that question in a database of systematic review questions. So you'll see that Prospero number on all the slides. Uh, that again is a, a, a unique identifier for that question in a database of questions of, that led systematic reviews. Um, next slide, please. This slide shows you a di the, the consort, or I'm sorry, Prisma diagram. Uh, and at the top of the slide, you see the number of records that we started out with, the ones that we screened for relevance to the question, PICO num uh, question number seven, approximately 3,300 records. And then we screened it down to five total that met the inclusion criteria for question number seven. Next slide, please. After the panel considered the quality of the evidence and those other factors that I mentioned earlier, they decided that there was just too little evidence and uh, too, little, too much heterogeneity in the information that was summarized to issue any recommendation whatsoever. So the systematic review number seven, uh, search number seven did not result in any recommendation regarding task load interventions. Next slide, please. PICO number six, or question number six, or systematic review number six, is as follows. EMS personnel and EMS personnel, does implementation of model-based fatigue, so those biomathematical models that I mentioned earlier, uh, do they mitigate fatigue, fatigue-related risk, and or improve sleep? And again, looking for evidence in shift workers, um, in particular EMS and related shift worker groups, of the implementation of a biomathematical model and if it had a positive impact or even no impact on fatigue-related outcomes. Next slide, please. We started out with approximately 2,700 records. We whittle it down to one. And we were, in addition to the panel, because some of our panelists are actually experts in biomathematical models. One of them on our panel actually has developed biomathematical models. We were very surprised by this finding that only one study met our criteria. And what we can chalk this up to is the fact that most of the data, data do exist. In fact, as I mentioned to you earlier, most of the commercial aviation uses biomathematical models. Other high-risk industries use biomathematical models. The data exists. It's just that the data have not yet been published in terms of the impact of implementing biomathematical models. So we know the data exists. It's mostly proprietary, and it has not yet been published. Next slide, please. And so the panel, again, just considered the weight of the evidence and said, you know what, we just don't have enough evidence here. Uh, we need more information to issue a recommendation. So no recommendation issued for uh, systematic review number six. Next slide, please. Question number five, or systematic review number five, dealt with basically, if you do fatigue education and training, does it help to mitigate fatigue and fatigue-related risk? Next slide. We started out with approximately 3,800 records, and we screened it down to 18. Five of those were, uh, they reported data related to one of our outcomes of interest in a very uniform format, which allowed us to do something called a meta-analysis to get a pooled effect. And so we were able to include not only a systematic review for this one, but also a meta-analysis. Next slide, please. And after considering the, the body of evidence, the quality of that evidence, and all those other factors that I mentioned earlier, the panel did issue a recommendation for this one uh, re regarding fatigue education and training. And the panel came up with this recommendation. We recommend that EMS personnel receive education and training to mitigate fatigue and fatigue-related risk. Now, given that uh, we only had 18 studies and that there were limitations associated with those studies, the panel did assign a weak recommendation in favor of the intervention. Uh, rather than a strong recommendation, which is very common. It is extremely rare that you ever find really, really high quality evidence when doing systematic reviews. You, in most cases, find moderate to low quality evidence. So this is actually not unexpected in terms of the assignment of strong versus weak. Next slide, please. 
Question number four dealt with napping on duty. Basically, if you allow crew members to nap on duty, does it help to mitigate fatigue and fatigue related risk? Next slide, please. We started out with approximately 4,600 studies or records and screened it down to 13 uh, intervention studies, three reported data in a homogeneous format, which allowed us to do a meta-analysis. So thank goodness we had not only a systematic review here, but also a meta-analysis for this one. Next slide, please. The panel did consider the evidence to be good evidence and decided not only to, uh, but also to issue a recommendation here. So the recommendation is as follows. We recommend that EMS personnel have the opportunity to nap while on duty to mitigate fatigue. And again, given the quality of the evidence, uh, they had some limitations. This one also, which is again, is very common in these uh, EBG projects, issued a weak recommendation in favor of the intervention. Uh, given the weight of the evidence and the quality of the evidence. But we do have a recommendation here that supports use of napping on duty. <clears throat> uh, next slide is uh, systematic review number three, which is deals with caffeine as a countermeasure. Our focus here was caffeine as a countermeasure. Next slide, please. We started out with approximately 1,400 studies. We screened it down to eight. Four allowed us to do a meta-analysis. Next slide. And the panel considered the evidence to be good and issued a recommendation basically uh, recommending access to caffeine as a fatigue countermeasure. And again, access is the key phrase here, access to caffeine as a countermeasure. Weak recommendation. Next slide, please. And I'm going to speed up a little bit here just to give or consider time. Um, in systematic review number two, one of the more visible issues about shift duration, so basically do uh, shorter duration shifts help mitigate fatigue and fatigue related risk versus longer duration shifts? Next slide, please. This one was what we call the beast. This one was a very large systematic review. Started out with 21,000 records, screened it down to 100. Next slide. And the panel did issue a recommendation here. The recommendation is we recommend that EMS personnel work shifts shorter than 24 hours in duration. Again, there were some limitations in the evidence, but the focus here I want to point out is that we had approximately one third of all the 100 that dealt with eight hour versus 12 hour shifts. Uh, 15 studies dealt with comparing 24-hour shifts versus less than 24-hour shifts, and the remaining uh, number of articles dealt with multiple comparisons of, of a variety of different shift durations. The key that uh, piece of evidence that led to this recommendation is the fact that when looking at the ratio of favorable versus unfavorable findings, given the comparison of 24 versus less than 24, the ratio of favorable going towards the shorter duration shift was 16 to 1. So there were, we had a really strong pattern that uh, favored the shorter duration shifts when looking specifically at shifts that were 24 hours in duration or less. Next slide, please. Question number one dealt with reliability and validity of instruments for measuring fatigue. Next slide. This was our diagnosis, diagnostic PICO question. We started out with 1,200. We screened it down to 34 studies that summarized 14 specific instruments. Next slide, please. And the panel considered it good enough evidence to issue a recommendation. We recommend using fatigue and sleepiness survey instruments, in particular the ones that have been shown in this review to be reliable and valid. Uh, and this one has actually a strong recommendation. Given those other factors, not just the quality of the evidence, but those other factors that I mentioned before, the panel decided to issue a strong recommendation for this one. Next slide, please. Again, summary here is we are talking about phase one. This is the summary of the EBG element or phase of the multi-phase study. The papers that will be published from this will come out later this fall. Next slide, please. And I wanna just highlight some significance here. So what do you have now? Or what will you have when the papers come out and are very visible uh, online for you? Local leaders now have a clear starting point from which to build their very own fatigue management program based on the best available evidence or a summary of the best available evidence. And also state, regional, national organizations also have a template from this work, uh, basically a frame of reference that they can use from which to help promote fatigue risk management at local agencies at the local level. Individual clinicians also have a resource here. They can now point to 
a summary of the best available evidence and point their organization's leadership to this evidence to say, look, here's some information that we could use to help manage our fatigue in our organization. So we do have significance here, not only at the local level, leadership level, but also at the state and also individual clinician level. Next slide, please. Dissemination, again, we have some papers that will be coming out. I'm also compiling all this information into a guidebook, which will be freely available via download on the ems.gov website uh, in the next, let's say, three or so months. We're doing presentations such as this one. We are producing a one-page handout. We're doing also interviews and writing editorials and commentaries for trade journals such as GEMS. Next slide, please. And I apologize for speeding up. I want to make sure we have time for questions. Uh, Mr. Bryson. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Patterson. Very good presentation. Uh, we now have a little bit of time here left to uh, perhaps uh, ask and get answers to a few of the audience's questions. Again, for folks who want to submit questions, please do it on the question section of the uh, dashboard there. Uh, i got a question here for you, Dr. Kupas. Uh, the question is, is there a liability concern if we don't use lights and sirens and something happens like a crash? Sure, I think that uh, you know, liability often comes up as one of the, one of the concerns here. And the, to me, the real issue with liability is we just wanna do the right thing, right? The right thing for the patient, the right thing for the general public that is around us that we're uh, driving through to keep everybody as safe as possible. And frankly, you know, by doing a non-lights and siren response and uh, stopping at traffic lights and being in the normal flow of traffic, your li liability really is is reduced. Um, uh, there are also issues of of potential liability with uh, with patient care, but again, everything that we do is a two-edged sword, and we have to weigh the risks and the benefits. Uh, but in general, reducing the lights and siren transport and response decreases our liability for motor vehicle crashes. Very good. Thank you, doctor. Uh, looks like we do have a question here for you, Dr. Patterson. Uh, one of my employees has a newborn at home and clearly isn't getting enough sleep. Should I not let him ride the ambulance? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, so let me just, again, reframe the context of these recommendations. So the recommendations are directed towards local EMS agency directors, ship supervisors, et cetera, management. And however, uh, we, we do want to also have individual clinicians to read these as well to get context in what is potentially informing the de decisions behind local leaders uh, framing their local uh, fatigue risk management program. One thing to point out here is that, and all of the fatigue management literature uses this as a, as a common phrase, um, fatigue risk management is a shared responsibility between the employee and the employer. While the recommendations that have been proposed here are directed towards the employer in, in, in context, it is also incumbent through adequate fatigue education and training, which has been recommended, through uh, PICO number five or question number five, that through adequate education and training, that the employee should also identify strategies that they can use not only on the job, but also at home to help them get as much rest and sleep as possible so that they are not in a situation when they get on the job overly fatigued and have diminished alertness. So the, the answer to that question is shift work is not going away, but we do have a shared responsibility both between the employee and the employer. And I think through PICO number five or question number five, education and training, situations like the one that you just described can be uh, addressed. Very good, thank you, Dr. Patterson. Uh, we're nearing the end of our time and we don't have a, a lot more questions here. I just wanted to uh, make a statement and then uh, we'll get to the closing so that all attendees are aware of where we are with uh, these two uh, great projects. Uh, as was mentioned by Dr. Kupas, the Lights and Sirens paper is available on ems.gov under the safety link. So you can go there now, print that out, download it, whatever you need to do, uh, and hopefully use that uh, there in your service. 
uh, so that you can start to look at uh, what's been done where there with lights and sirens and refer back to this webinar in the future if you have any additional questions or needs. So uh, that has been done, complete, and is available on ems.gov for those that want to go out and get it. Uh, you can also, for Dr. Patterson's work, as he's mentioned, uh, there are two more phases we're now going into uh, as he nears the end of the first phase, as was mentioned. So there's still more work ahead uh, for Dr. Patterson and the rest of the team uh, working on that. So there'll be a lot more opportunity uh, for you to go to presentations and have an opportunity to discuss this with uh, Dr. Patterson. If you go to EMS fatigue dot org org uh, you'll learn a lot more about what dr patterson had to say today uh, contact information for him as well uh, as this is an ongoing project and an opportunity uh, for the ems community uh, to get involved and to ask your questions and understand uh, more and more about where we're heading with the ems fatigue project I'd like to thank both of our panelists uh, for sharing your great work uh, and all that you've done to help make EMS safer for EMS personnel, our patients, uh, and for our communities. Uh, it is great work here. Thank you for condensing somehow, some way into the short presentations you provided uh, based on our limited time today. Uh, I think you did an outstanding job. It's a lot of material to cover, uh, and we really appreciate appreciate you taking the time and doing that for us. Also want to thank all of you, the attendees, for joining us today and for the great questions that you provided. Uh, just as a reminder, this webinar will be archived on EMS.gov. Uh, we thank you, stay safe, and please enjoy the rest of your day.